Well, welcome on this uh, 23rd day of April, Saturday, April 23rd, 2022. Iowa football spring practice is now complete. And man, it uh, it ended as quick as it started. Seems like it was just yesterday that we were uh, getting things rolling for the first time this spring. Iowa spring practice concludes with a bevy of players inactive today for its final open or final spring practice, fi uh, only open practice of the season. We'll get to those players who are uh, we're not on the field today. We'll get to those guys in a moment. We'll talk about uh, projecting projecting forward concerns, uh, positions of strength, what we kind of gathered from Kirk Ferentz's words today uh, with the press, and much more. I'm going to open up the call line as well. Um, a reminder first, though, before we get going, that uh, and I need to do this more often. Mark, uh, Mark Rogers and I, we've had these discussions about how we need to um, promote a little bit better <laughs> because, um, we're trying to produce great content. We're trying, and sometimes we forget to promote. And so, uh, let me do that for a moment. First of all, uh, this is from the Hawkeye of the storm. If you're new to the platform here on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. Please hit the like button on this stream as well. And it does help. Word of mouth is huge. If you can, if you can tell your friends, um, or those who are uh, Hawkeye fans, about the show that always helps and um, certainly if you want to sponsor the show that's the other thing I wanted to bring up I'm going to throw up the email from the eye of the storm at outlook.com that's how to get in touch with me if you're inquiring about sponsorship uh, we are from the Hawkeye of the storm the email is from the eye of the storm at outlook.com had a couple sponsors here jump on appreciate the support but we're going to need more and more support as we go into summer and certainly once we get to football season, we're going to be going full board, full bore on Iowa football and then heading into Iowa basketball season in November. So lots to get to. And listen, I'm not going anywhere this offseason, as you noticed. Um, still a lot to, to go. We know the transfer portal is going to be really active for both the men's and women's game. Who knows if Iowa football will utilize it? We can talk about it. Um, and then, of course, there's recruiting all kinds of um news tidbits that uh, I'll have covered for you right here from the Hawkeye of the Storm. So please sponsor the show. Reach out to me from the eye of the storm at outlook.com. And then on the bottom ticker here, actually, let me just throw it up here as a banner. If you want to donate to the channel, you can certainly do that by means of super chats, super stickers. That's always appreciated. But if you would like to donate uh, to the channel, you can do so in the description below. All right. So if you want to do it by super chat, you can do it. There's a button there if you're on the YouTube app. But if you want to donate, um, via PayPal to this channel. Um, that's always appreciated. And you can do that in the description below with the link below. I also want to, uh, I'm not seeing the super chat. I don't want to miss the super chat uh, from Bradley. Let me see if I can find it here. And uh, Mark and I did not do a good job of coordinating this because I see he's live as well. So hopefully I'm not taking people away from him and hopefully he's not taking people away from me. Get a little bit of a, a feedback here. Let me see if I can find. So I'm not seeing it. I think it disappeared due to the fact that it's a super chat. But Bradley, uh, is it Bradley Gibson? Bradley Gibson, thank you. And L Lemansky, thank you for recognizing that. It was there earlier. I saw it. Bradley, I got your super chat. Thank you very much. And uh, I wish I could read that super chat over the air, Bradley. But thank you for your uh, support. And uh, certainly everybody for being here. Uh, yes, please hit the like button. Thank you for this Lemansky as well. We're going to get to some of what uh, Kirk Ferentz discussed, including leadership and personality, something that uh, Kirk really highlighted today. Hawkeye Howard, good to see you here, buddy. Hope things are well in Southern Missouri. Erica over in, I believe, the Chicago area. Good to see you, Erica. Um, Doug Phelps. Good to see you here, Doug. Um, and just for, for anybody who's here, who's not aware, I was not able to attend the spring game in person today. I, I wanted to. I would have loved to. Um, my recovery is going well. Appreciate some people who have reached out over the past couple of weeks and asked about how it's been going. But um, I had therapy today, and and uh, it was not worth missing therapy. So i uh, going to try to get as much footage from today's event as possible over the next couple of days. And... Um, be able to give you some more, more and more feedback. I'd love to hear from you. If you were at the game today, the, I shouldn't even say game, the practice. If you were at the spring practice today, 
please call in, let me know, or chat. The number, I'll throw the number up here now. The number to call in is 515-635-1601. 515-635-1601. Throw it up there on the bottom ticker so we can keep taking comments. Um, let me let me grab the call line because I just threw that up there. I don't have it open. Now it's open. Now it is open. So, um, again, 515-635-1601 if you want to call the show and uh, ask your questions or comments. Ferris is here. Good to see you, Ferris. Uh, I'm guessing Ferris is uh, jumping back and forth between this show and Mark Rogers' show. So, Ferris, thank you. I know you're a Michigan fan. Uh, Appreciate you being here today. Toxic Kid could not have asked for a better weather day than this. I I don't know what the weather was like in Iowa City. I know we had a lot of rain earlier in the day. So, I'd love to know Toxic Kid. Now, it's it's in the 70s here in Ames now. Um, So, I don't know if the rain affected the... Um, early game, or excuse me, the, the spring practice. And this is Randy Engel. Randy, thank you for identifying yourself. Or I would have thought you were somebody named uh, T- Toxic Kid. Uh, Randy, appreciate you being here, Randy. And uh, give a shout out to Randy. Randy will be uh, sponsoring our shows next month. So thank you, Randy. And yes, uh, I'll say this. If, if spring practice was held with weather like we have here this afternoon, here names, boy, this is a gorgeous day for, for spring football. Um, and, you know, typically you're going to get cool weather in April, uh, but it is so back and forth. You never know what you're going to get for this final open practice uh, of the year. Um, The super fan disciple says, looking forward to hearing about the QBs. I see the the correction there, QBs. And um, I think a lot of people are, uh, to be quite frank. And uh, it's kind of a mixed bag from what I heard. That's not a surprise. Of course, the hype train is strong for Joey Labus as the third stringer. And we can talk about it. Um, I will say this. I, I think that the, we need to pump the brakes. And I know fans don't want to hear that, those who are excited about someone like Joey Labus. But I think we need to pump the brakes on the hype because Joey Labus, as much potential as this kid may have, um, you know, the, I, I'll give you a perfect example. The tweet that went out by an Iowa media member about a, what is it, a 44-yard pass today? Uh, or here, here's Doug's going to bring it up. The 40-yard bomb. Uh, from Labus to, I believe it was uh, Caden Wetgen, the transfer from Iowa Western, who is, by the way, I think going to be a factor this fall and nobody's talking about him, but we'll we'll, we'll have to wait and see on that. Um, but that's against the third string, thir- third string defense. And I, you know, Caden Wetgen may be third string offense right now, but I think he's going to get some time, at least on special teams this fall. And look, you, you can't accurately and efficiently judge these quarterbacks against one another without seeing them against the same competition for the same number of reps. And I've talked about that. Don Patterson has talked about that. Uh, he he always uses the the expression equal, um, equal snaps against equal competition. And that's the key right now. And hopefully that happened this spring. Again, I wasn't at the game, so I wasn't tracking, okay, how many snaps did the Labus get against the first team offense? How many snaps did Petrus get against the first team offense? How many snaps did Padilla get? What I will say is it wasn't a very long spring practice. Now, again, I don't really remember. It's been a couple of years since I've been to a spring practice. I think I was at the 2019 spring practice, and that, I believe, was held in the evening. But I, it's, it's, I, I have a hard time remembering if they're typically longer than an hour and a half, because I think the spring practice day, what, started at 9.45 and ended at like 11.15, maybe 11.30. I thought it was really short, frankly. And I could be wrong on that. Uh, Maybe correct me if I'm wrong there, but um, I'll I'll be anxious to get some footage from from the event today and and be able to get a feel um, for how uh, Joey performed. Doug says he donated via PayPal. Thank you for this, Doug. Appreciate you doing that. Appreciate you being here as always. Erica says, does anyone know why Iowa didn't do a or doesn't do a spring game like other teams? Just curious. That's a good question, Erica. I, I don't really know the answer to that. It's been a long time. Uh, I'd love to know when the last time Iowa ran a spring game was, um, because here's what it does. And and I'm not, this is not something I'm going to pick at with Kirk Ferentz. I, I've been critical of Kirk with other things, and I think people know that, but I'm not going to be critical of this. I will say this exposure wise, it limits what you can, what, what, what your spring exposure is going to be especially when you're talking about the big 10 network now we've had the big 10 network for what over 10 well over 10 years right 
when did that start? Like 2008, somewhere in there. And so when you don't have a spring game, yeah, it's going to limit that exposure for, for spring. And I don't think that's a good thing for recruiting um, or for your brand, but obviously Kirk's not too concerned with that, or we would have a spring game. And frankly, I, I know Iowa fans are passionate. I, I don't really have much interest in going and watching. Um, I don't really have much interest in going watching a spring practice where guys are literally running drills. And, and I, I just don't have a lot of interest in doing that. Now, Don Patterson, I know he wasn't able to make it to the game uh, today or the practice today either. But, um, you know, being a, a, a longtime coach, he's he finds more joy in that. And uh, I can do that for a while, but I would prefer a spring game. I think most fans would prefer a spring game. And again, it, it, it's, it gives you a bit of a more of a structure as far as weighing um, offense versus defense and whatnot. The other thing you got to remember is we overhype spring. The media has very little to talk about. So, so the quarterback's going to be talked about. Young guys are going to be talked about. And every year we get excited about a guy and every year somebody fails to meet our expectations and that's unfair to the young guys. So it was good to see, I'm sure it was good to see um, some of these young guys in action today. I do think Xavier Wampa is going to play a lot. Um, I do think that we're going to see DJ Hall at some point got word that uh, um, Jamari Harris is likely going to miss game one. And that was a question that I had earlier in the week when he got arrested rare that Iowa has OWIs in the spring. And we saw Josiah Mia a year ago, get into a fight with police run from police, get into a fight at a bar. And basically um, he was back within a week or two in spring. So that is something that kind of surprised me that Kirk basically let the cat out of the bag, that he would be suspended for that first game. But at the same time, it's South Dakota state shouldn't matter. Right. But uh, it is a blow and it's a, it's discipline for a guy, guy who made a mistake in Jamari Harris. Um, Yes, in, in in answer to your question, Eric, I don't know why I would like to see it as well. It would certainly produce, I think, more hype. I think more attention uh, across the country. Uh, how about the volunteer quarterbacks coach and Xavier, where he was playing? Um, so John Bud Meyer, you're talking about John Bud Meyer as a volunteer QBs coach. He's not technically a QBs coach. I'm going to establish that. Okay, he is a he's an analyst. Okay, and I, I do want to read you. I do want to read you uh, a an email that I'd gotten from compliance. And uh, I know people who listened to this show a couple of weeks ago, my show with Mark Rogers knows that I'd been reaching out to compliance for like two weeks. And then uh, a day after the Des Moines register got an email, I got an email. So I, I guess I'm not high on the totem pole of importance, but I do want to read you this, uh, this email that compliance finally sent me as in regards to what John Budmeyer is able to do. And I don't know how involved he was today, but going off this email from compliance, there he's really not allowed to do a whole lot with players. Let me read you the exact language of this email. Um, I'm going to read it word for word. So there's a typo in here. I apologize. I'm going to quote it word from word. This is according to the compliance office, University of Iowa Athletics Compliance. An institutional staff member or any other individual outside the institution with whom the institution has made arrangements must count against coaching limits in the applicable sport as soon as as the individual participates in any manner in any of the following provides technical or tactical instruction related to the sport to a student athlete at any time makes or assists in making tactical decisions or related to the sport during on court or on field practice or competition or engages in any off campus recruiting activity. So let me kind of sum this up if I, if I can, and I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to jump to conclusions. I'm going to try to paraphrase this and put this in layman's terms. As John Budmeyer is a, is a volunteer staff member, he's not able to act like a Brian Ferentz, like a Seth Wallace, like a Phil Parker. He is not a position coach. So he cannot provide tactical or technical instruction to any player at any time on or off the field. So we're talking film room, we're talking practice, we're talking games. He cannot do that as a volunteer, okay? Um, because if he was doing that, it would count against the the limit. There is a rule. The NCAA has a rule on the number of coaches who can be involved um, on game day with tactical and technical instruction. He also cannot assist or make decisions, tactical decisions, during practice or during a game. And he can't recruit. So those are the rules. That's what compliance sent me. That's the information 
that was released as it relates to any volunteer, not just John Budmeyer, but I do have hope here and answer your question to super fan disciple. I have hope that John Budmeyer can help Brian Ferentz, but I, I just don't know if you're going by the rules here. I don't know how involved he can be with Spencer Petrus, Joey Labus, Carson May, and Alex Padilla. I just don't know how, how, how if he can't provide tactical instruction on or off the field, then he can't really help these guys one-on-one. I, that's the language of what the compliance office is saying here. So again, um, hopefully he can help Brian because John Budmeyer is a former quarterback. He's a former quarterback's coach. He's a former coordinator. So I think the hope here is he can talk to, to Brian Ferentz as much as he wants and he can give him assistance. And that is going to be, I think from a fundamental standpoint, that's, that's probably the biggest plus plus side of having a guy like John Budmeyer. Um, now will John Budmeyer be here next year? I doubt it. I don't know what his contract at Colorado state involved. You know, somebody brought that up. Could he be getting paid from Colorado state and perhaps he doesn't want to make money because if he made money, he would lose that year of pay. I don't know that that's the case. That may be, maybe there's some substance there, but my guess he's not here long-term, but if he can help Brian get up to speed on some of these things, maybe there's some hope. I mean, again, I'm not trying to inspire an enormous amount, uh, an inordinate amount of confidence in Brian Ferentz to be able to coach fundamentals. And he's basically admitted as admitted as such. Okay. That, uh, he really doesn't, I mean, he admitted frankly a few weeks ago, he doesn't know how to throw a football. Okay. And, and that's how I was quarterbacks coach. So John can help. I would hope he can help in that regard. Also, we know Spencer Petrus has a private coach. My, I wouldn't be surprised if Alex Padilla has a private coach and Joey Labus has a private coach. Do I like that? I don't, I think, you know, these guys should be able to, I mean, I understand during the off season, you need someone to work with you, but um, I think it's a conflict to some degree. It's certainly a conflict of interest because if the coaches have a, a particular relationship with Tony Rassiopi out, out East, and this guy's coaching Spencer Petrus, and in a year he's going to be with Marco Linez, who's going to be on the roster, and he's not coaching the other two guys. And that's, that's is that fair to Alex Padilla, Carson May, et cetera? I guess that's that's a question I've brought up in the past. But John Budmeyer being on staff, I, I guess, is a positive right now because he does have experience at that quarterback position. He has experience coaching it. Xavier, um, I've heard nothing but good things about Xavier Wampa. Kirk was asked about Xavier today, and it sounds like he's really progressing, which is good. Um, and I expect him to play. Do I think he's going to start at safety? I, I don't know. I think there's a lot of those battles that will be sorted out this fall. And the good news is, this is one thing I am confident with this team right now. I do think that this team is going to really thrive off depth. And there are a couple positions where they're not going to be deep. They're not going to be deep at tight end, and they're not going to be deep at running back, okay? Unless they, uh, you know, grab somebody in the portal at running back this this summer, which is possible. They've done that in the past with James Butler from Nevada, a Mackay Sargent from Iowa Western. But unless they do that, um, they're going to be pretty thin. And that's a concern because running back is a, is a position I always had problems staying healthy at in the past. Tight end. Um, I know Lachey was out. He's he's banged up right now. Sounds like a hand injury, but um, you'd, you'd hope he's going to be back um, because they, I mean, as far as I'm aware, there were two guys on scholarship this spring at that position, and only one of those guys played today, and that was Sam Laporta. So opportunity for the for the walk-ons and an opportunity for a guy like Steven Stilianos when he gets there, here this summer, and then the freshman, Ad, uh, Addison Estringa, and um, – Kale Vanderbush, both getting here later this year. David, Kirk doesn't have a spring game because of the risk of injuries to the players. Yeah, so I, I don't know, you know, David, and you're probably right. I, I don't have a, a comparison um, as it relates to other teams and their injury numbers. But since we're talking about injuries, let me go ahead and read the tweet that uh, was in regards to the number of guys injured today, or at least guys who were not on the field. Um, according to Chad Lystico of the Des Moines Register, he tweeted out this afternoon, injured list as far as we can tell, DeYoung, Mislinski, Britt, Liddell, Dunker, Vines, Keegan Johnson, Lachey, Hilson, Bowie, Herkett, Sullivan, Evans, Benson, Campbell, Jacobs, Harris, Merriweather, Roberts, Amaya, Mike Tim. That's 21 guys, folks. That's 21 guys. That's a lot. Okay. That's a lot. And especially when you consider the fact that you don't have your other true freshman here yet. 
because they're not enrolling until later this year. That's a lot of guys. Um, now you can say it's, it's precautionary. I heard somebody tweet that out. Okay. Maybe it is, but okay. We're not going to run a spring game, but yet we still have this many guys hurt. I, I, I don't know. I'd love to know the data behind injuries that take place during a formal spring game, because I would think that Kirk is probably not ahead of the curve on this. I would think that if guys are getting hurt at a high rate in spring games, that other teams would reconsider having those spring games. But you got to weigh uh, risk and reward, and I do think there is a reward for having a spring game, and it's something that Iowa is missing out on right now. And yes, there were there have been spring games where serious injuries have taken place. The good news is what Kirk said today, it doesn't sound like any of these guys had serious injuries. Most of these guys are going to be back by June. That's positive. Um, M. Finn says, all those analysts are at Alabama are just watching film. Yeah, I, I can't, I'm not saying that guys aren't breaking the rules at, at different places, but I guess it's either John Budmeyer is here playing by the rules or he's not. And if he's not, do we want to be privy to that? I, I, I don't know. I'm not going to assume that he's breaking the rules. I, I, I'm not going to assume that, but I get what you're saying. Um, there are a lot of analysts at Alabama year in and year out and that end up being really highly sought after position coaches um, a year or two down the road. So um, I understand where you're coming from, Bud. Bud says it's just dumb that fans want to name Labus the starter because he went five and five against five for five against the third team defense. I'd bet the first team defense would light him up. Uh, well, Bud, let's remember, and I play devil's advocate on this. It sounded like he was also running with the third team offense, which would make sense. Um, but I agree with you. I agree with you. You can't weigh this evenly and act like, well, this means he needs to be the starter. None of this means anybody's going to be the starter. I do have a, a bit of a problem with Kirk continuing to say that Spencer Petrus is in front. If it's open competition, why are we continuing to label Spencer as the, as the number one guy? You know, I mean, Kirk was asked today about it is Spencer the front runner? And he said, yeah, he is, but it's an open competition. I just don't even know why, why do we have to say that? Why, why do we have to say he's the front runner? I, I just don't get, what does that do? What is that? What positive thing does that do? I, I just, somebody explain it to me. I'd love to know what it is. Are we trying to just incite Spencer Petrus with confidence? Does he need that at this point? I don't know. It's uh, a little bit confusing there. Um, Lewanski says, thank you for reading compliance email about John Budmeyer. Now thinking Ferentz not going to discuss John as he's not a staff member, only volunteer. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what I don't think Kirk would probably have any hesitancy if he was asked. And he, he's been asked a bit, a little bit about John Budmeyer. I know uh, Brian Ferentz was asked about John, but I'm sure if that gets brought up to, to Kirk in the future, he'll he'll talk about him. I mean, it's not that he can't talk about John Budmeyer, but he is not getting paid by the university, according to. Um, the uh, open records request. So, um, you know, he's here to help. I'm assuming um, Brian behind the scenes. And yeah, he's got some other duties. The volunteer description basically said he was here to to work on opposing depth charts and, and scouts and whatnot. So that's a valuable job. But as I said before, it's a little bit odd that you have a f- coordinator at a high major program in Colorado State last year who gets one year, the head coach gets fired. Now he's here as an unpaid volunteer, which makes me think something else is going on. And it might be he's getting paid at Colorado State. I haven't confirmed that, but wouldn't be shocked. D-Dub, I've read that Petrus was the most inconsistent, much like the prior seasons. Always wish the best for him. But if that's the case, the season won't be any better on that end. I'm not going to disagree with much of that, D-Dub. Um, but again, we'll see. You hope it's an open competition. You don't want to assume that. I mean, I'm not going to imply that 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 uh, Kirk is being um, disingenuous, but I would like to see equal reps against equal competition, and maybe that happened this spring. We get a tiny glimpse into spring practice every year, and we we take that and run with it. So we really don't know. We won't. I get. We really won't find out until right September third, September fourth, whenever the first game is. We'll just have to wait and see. Erica says people say that Labus should be the starter because they don't have confidence in Alex or Spencer. It doesn't make much sense since we've never seen him play, but ever, you know, it, I'll say this, Brian is, is spot on that. You always like the next guy. Now I didn't like the fact that Brian said that they're going to, people are going to love Labus until they see him play. It doesn't sound great. I don't think he meant anything by it, but it is true that, you, you know, I've, I've went off on people watch this channel or watch the Iowa voice of college football channel last year. I was going off on fans early last season about dogging on Spencer because I thought Spencer deserved time. 
Um, I had seen some improvement since Spencer Petras, specifically with the long ball. And I thought he, I thought he took a couple steps back throughout the year. That's just, that's how I see it. And that's me trying to be objective. I thought he took a couple steps back as the season went on. And that's when I started to think, well, you need to consider making some changes here. Um, but I was, I was frustrated with people who were acting like Spencer Petras hadn't made any improvement early on because I, I did see improvement specifically against Colorado state, hit the deep ball a couple times. We saw a really good second quarter at Iowa state last year, but he's got to be more consistent. You're absolutely right, Erica. And whoever there was that, that brought up consistency, Spencer Petras has made the nice throws at times. He's got the arm to make nice throws. The problem is he's not mobile. He's not consistent and he doesn't always show great fundamentals in the pocket. And that's a, that's a problem. And maybe those things will be corrected. Maybe they have been corrected, but I, I don't, I've not seen anything to tell me that they have. Okay. Um, again, the phone line is open 515-635-1601, 515-635-1601. And I do want to run through the depth chart for anybody who, um, I'm not going to really run through the depth chart, I guess, but I want to run through uh, my positions of strength, my positions of weakness, so to speak. Um, because I, I do feel pretty good about depth in general, um, looking at the injuries, uh, today, you know, you've got several guys missing at linebacker. Um, certainly Seth Benson, Jack Campbell, Justin Jacobs, you've got your, your, your three main guys that you're, you know, you didn't get to see today plus, uh, justice Sullivan. So maybe your top four guys were out. So, um, depth at that position should be better because those younger guys behind those four, I'm assuming today's not the only day those guys got a, a longer run. Um, I don't, I'm not concerned about depth at linebacker. You look at wide receiver, you know, you're missing Keegan Johnson, Johnson today. I've talked about Arlen Bruce, Charlie Jones, Nico Regani. You've got four guys. I think you're confident in after that. I know there's been some hype around Brody Breck. That'll have to be proven to me. I know he's very much involved in baseball. I think it's going to be hard for him to gain traction, but you've got four guys you like, and I don't know that you need, Many more guys. Maybe Jackson Ritter, walk on, who played a little last year. He maybe he comes into the mix as well. That's a possibility. Um, you know, center's a concern. Of course, we know that with Tyler Linderbaum leaving, is it going to be Logan Jones? Michael Muslinski's been hurt. Um, you know, Tyler Ellsbury is another guy that that uh, has been getting some run there. I do know that Lucas Amaya is out for two to three weeks, um, according to a source that reached out to me, um, he's going to be out two to, or excuse me, two to three months. I'm sorry, two to three months. So the kicking battle is between Aaron Blom and Drew Stevens right now. And I don't see that changing. Um, you hope Lucas Omaya can provide some battle there because those two kickers, what it sounded like today, were both inconsistent with their kicks. Now that granted they've been inside most of the, most of the spring, they finally got some out, outside temperatures and outside wind. And that, that does play a factor, but Drew Stevens, and Aaron Blom are going to be the guys. So that's a that's a position of concern as it relates to um, just in general, who's going to take that job because Iowa's been so strong at the place-kicking position in recent years. Um, if they're not, then the, the lack of red zone efficiency is going to come back to bite you at some point. So either the red zone efficiency has got to get a lot better or they got to find somebody to replace Caleb Shudak, Miguel Racinos, Keith Duncan, all those guys who have been absolutely unbelievable for Iowa in recent time. Um. I do like defensive line. I know there's a lot of hype today about the defensive line. Sounds like Lucas Van Ness has really taken a step forward at defensive end. That's a great thing. Um, physically, he, he, he's got the intangibles. I think he's like 6'5", 285, bulky kid. He's, he's certainly put on some weight. He's going to get bigger this summer. Um, Kirk was very complimentary of Noah Shannon on the inside. That's positive. Logan Lee sounds like he's making good progress. Um, Joe Evans is going to give you what Joe Evans gives you. I mean, he's not going to be a big... Uh, he's not going to be Epinesa. He's not going to be, he's not that type of a, a edge rusher, but he's going to give you energy, especially on third down and fourth down, critical downs. He's going to give you a good pass rush. Um, you lose Van Valkenburg. We realize that, you know, can a guy like Deontay Craig take a step forward? Didn't hear much about him this spring, but he's a guy who um, could possibly uh, step into a starting role at some point. I mean, I, I, I think there's a lot of battles that are going to continue deep into fall. Yeah, and I think Brian Allen Jr., I've heard nothing but good things about him. Early enrollee Lee in the 2022 class. Heard good things early in the spring about, about his play. Um, and then Aaron Graves. Let's not forget Aaron Graves, the, the standout from Southeast Valley, is going to be here in a few months or a couple months. That's going to be – I think Aaron Graves is going to play uh, year one. I've been saying that. 
for literally like the last year. All right. Every time I've talked about Aaron Graves, I, I think he's going to play right away. He is a physical specimen. And, that, and I know we use that terminology a lot, but he is absolutely a physical specimen. Will they run him more on the inside? Will they run him more on the outside? That's a question I, I don't have the answer to. Um, but I do think that uh, he's going to play. And I, I just got a, a tweet from uh, from somebody on Twitter, somebody wondering if we're live. So I got to make sure that they know we are live. Um, I'm guessing that Darrell MVP is not yet with us or he'd be calling. So I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed in Darrell MVP. Let me just say that. Um and uh, but again, the line is open, so we haven't gotten any calls yet, but I'm going to keep this open. And I plan on being here until 2:45, three o'clock. So um, hopefully we can get more people 52 on now. Please share this video if you haven't already done so. Please help the video and, and certainly the like button helps as well. Lemansky, thank you for reminding everybody of that. Um, I do want to run through. Let me pull these banners up that I had prepared. Um, at wide receiver. So we're talking about wide receiver. We're talking about tight end. Um, defensive back. Um, you know, that's going to be a battle. It's going to be an interesting battle because you got some young guys. I know everybody was hyping up the 22 recruiting class. I do like that class. You got to love it when you got Xavier Wampa and TJ Hall, who I think was underrated um, out of California. Don Patterson helps them get TJ Hall. Both those guys enrolled early. You're going to get Orlando Trader and um, Cohen and Tringer coming in later this year to help with, with depth. But with Jamari Harris being out, due to that OWI, and I, I sad for Jamari. I think he's probably upset that he made the mistake, but it does give other guys an opportunity. Terry Roberts, unfortunately, did not play today. Uh, Cooper DeJean is going to have an opportunity to really, um, I, th I think he's going to have an opportunity to play a lot this year. And I know he's still a young guy, but man, you look at Xavier Wampa, you look at Cooper DeJean, this is a, a young group of defensive backs. Quinn Schulte looked good today from everything I heard. Uh, he's going to get some run at safety. Um, Terry Roberts, I, I hope he can grab a starting spot. He's been so dominant and consistent on special teams the length of his career here. You just hope he can conceivably grab a spot. And certainly he's going to be that third guy if it's Jermari and, and Riley Moss. And let's remember, too, cornerbacks consistently get hurt here. That's just how it works. And I don't think that's probably exclusive to Iowa. But they're going to need... Um, they're going to need production. Jack Kerner's gone, right? He, he had 88 tackles last year. Tremendous year. Great open field tackler. Mr. Reliable. He's taking a shot at the NFL. Happy for him. But they're going to have to figure out a replacement. They could do have Kayvon Merriweather back. He's going to have to be the leader on the back end. Um, you know, who's going to fill the other spot? I think you could look at a number of guys. Could it be Sebastian Castro? Could it be Quinn Schulte, Xavier Wampa, Cooper DeJean? I mean, there's four guys right there. I don't think any of us would be shocked to see any one of those four as the other starter this fall. That's good. That's depth. Okay. And I think they have got really good depth at safety, good depth, adequate depth at cornerback, a bit of a unproven commodity at cornerback. Once you get past those top three, you know, we don't really know what we're going to get out of, you know, trader Diaz Fernandez or uh, TJ hall. But I think the upside of those guys is good and high. And again, with injuries, depth always comes into play at defensive back offensive line is probably the biggest concern besides quarterback for me. Um, it sounded like the defensive line really, really outplayed uh, the offensive line today, which isn't really a surprise. I think that's pretty much consistent with with what we see year in and year out uh, during the spring open spring practice. Um, the bottom line is those guys got to get bigger, faster, stronger, uh, specifically bigger and stronger. I mean, this this summer is going to be huge for guys like Richmond, for guys like Colby and guys like DeYoung, because those guys got pushed around last year. And that's not good. I mean. They're young, so they got an opportunity to grow. But I saw Jack Plum get pushed around last year. He was a what a fourth year guy last year. Time is now for Jack Plum. The time is now. And and for the record, Kirk Ferentz was very complimentary of Jack Plum today as well. But what's Kirk, what's Kirk going to say that Jack Plum isn't playing well? That Nick DeYoung's not playing well? I mean, I don't think Kirk's going to say that. But he did make a point of bringing up Jack Plum, so that's positive. Um, we talked about center guard. You know, Justin Britt's going to be a guy who's going to have to, I think, play a lot of snaps this year, and, and he should be. I mean, I think, what, he's a four- or five-year guy now? He's a fourth-year guy. Um, Cody Ince is gone. Kyler Schott's gone. Tyler Linderbaum's gone. The inside, I'm not going to call it depleted, but a lot of unproven experience there. Connor Colby, some reports are saying that he's been getting more time on the outside. 
Um, so maybe they end up running. I don't know if DeYoung can play guard, if he would end up at guard. I think Richmond's set at left guard and Plum, if he's, I mean, he's only got one more year, right? But if he plays at right tackle, um, you know, who, who's going to play on the inside? I, I just, that's, that's going to be an interesting question because Connor Colby apparently has been taking some snaps at right tackle. So a lot of interesting uh, uh, battles there, but I, I do like depth of this team. Tied in, I'm just not concerned with depth because you do have a grad transfer coming in. I do, I'm, I'm high on Addison Estringa. I don't know as much about Kale Vanderbush, but um, we've seen young tight ends, TJ Hawkinson, a perfect example of a guy a year or two in, really take that next step. And so um, we'll just have to wait and see. Bradley says, what's your honest opinion on Caden Proctor? Do we get him? Bradley, uh, I, I felt good about his recruitment ever since the Xavier commitment. Um, that Now, I will say this. There was a time, Bradley, where I felt like uh, Iowa was in good shape with Kyler Casper, and maybe that was me lying to myself. But um, the fact is, uh, I should have never felt good about Kyler's recruitment. I know I talked about this with Mark Rogers, uh, and I'm not trying to diss anybody. But I'll ask the same question I asked Mark on Tuesday. Why would you, if you're an elite four-star wide receiver, want to come play wide receiver at Iowa? I mean, and, and I'm an Iowa. People question, are you actually a fan? I've had somebody say you need to be the the cyclone of the storm, which I found hilarious. Um I'm a huge fan. I'm a big Iowa guy, right? Uh, I wouldn't be doing this show if I wasn't. But again, uh, if I'm an elite wide receiver, I would be thinking long and hard about coming to, to Iowa. And we've seen that. How many guys is Fran McCaffrey? How many guys is Fran McCaffrey? How many guys is Kirk Ferentz put in the NFL at that position who have actually lasted? Marvin McNutt didn't last. Darrell Johnson Coolianos didn't last. Cavante Martin Manley didn't, didn't, uh, didn't last. Clinton Solomon ended up playing a long time in the CFL, but he didn't last. Kyler Casper didn't really, or excuse me, Kyler, Kevin Casper. I mean, uh, Brandon Smith and Amir Smith Marset are fighting to make it, but I guess the point is, I don't, I don't uh, have any problem with Kyler going to Oregon. And you can blame NIL if you want. You can blame NIL if you want, but it, you got multiple things working against you at this point. And so that's what I would say. I do believe that Iowa has a shot at, at Caden Proctor. I think they've got a good shot. He's an offensive lineman, right? And he's good friends with Xavier Wampa, played with Xavier Wampa in high school. But, uh, of course, he's a 23 guy. So we got I, – I think – I don't think we're, we'll hear a, a decision from Caden for a while, but I do think they're in good shape with him. If they don't get him, that's a huge blow because that means they've lost out on three huge recruits that I think everybody thought they had a sh shot at in Kyler Casper, Mac Markway, and Caden Proctor. And I never felt real high on Mac Markway coming here, but I did think that they had a good shot at landing both Caden and – Kyler Casper. All right, let's take our first call of the day. Thank you for calling from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Who's on the line? Lomansky, Corey. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Lomansky. We've had uh, our spring game, so I guess I'm going to ask a question about expectations. We've been labeled a program that's eight and four for the last, I'm going to be inaccurate here, but basically over the last 10 years. Uh, maybe it's even longer, you remember better than me, what that time period entails. And I guess trying to figure out what my expectations are for season 2022. And I guess I'm going to give you a farm analogy that you can laugh at and say I'm nuts. You know, I feel like the Iowa, uh, you know, where we've been and where we are, it's like going out in the field and planting seed corn, and you've kind of watched this hybrid grow in the field for three consecutive years and the yield's been about the same and hasn't improved and there's even been a dip in production of your of your yield on your on your corn uh, yield what should our expectation be i guess for such an experienced head coach and he's made the adjustments he deems are satisfactory last year I guess my expectations are because he's made a few changes and adjustments and hired new coaches on the tight end position. And we've got a volunteer and we've got a new offensive coordinator and we lost our quarterback's coach to retirement. I think our expectations should be playing the East division for the big 10 title. I don't see why we should step back and say, Hey, you know, uh, eight wins, nine wins is good enough. I think, this coming fall, you know, we should 
especially when you look at Wisconsin and Mertz hasn't really performed and, and he was highly touted. We should be, we should be in the big 10 title game. I, I guess in the past, I kind of, uh, I'm one of those fans that you talk about that we're, what do you want polite or we, we settle. I don't feel like settling this fall. I'll just listen to your comments. Well, first of all, this is an open forum, so we can we can talk about different subjects. Can I challenge you on something that you you just brought out in your question, Lemansky? Sure. So you correct me if I'm wrong, but you use the fact that Iowa got rid of its quarterbacks coach as reason to be positive. Is that is that correct? No, I didn't mean it positive. I'm just I'm just giving the giving the context of okay. my response. And he retired. Actually, we we didn't make a move, but it does leave open an opportunity for adjustment. And I guess you can, you know, from the past that I, um, this Rassiope thing, just, I'm so confused. I think about it, if it was a business, you know, you make a move and it's called an, it's called a, uh, volunteer. I'm just, I'm just so confused over that. It almost weighs nothing with me now. Well, here's, here's what I'll say, Lemansky. Um, as it relates to the quarterback opening, the quarterback coach opening. So you're right. It, it, I mean, there, it's clear, and it's nothing against Ken O'Keefe, but was anybody in their right mind, does anybody in their right mind say that Ken O'Keefe was getting the job done at that position? I would say the statistics say no. No, I mean, I don't think anybody, I don't know anybody in their right mind that could argue that the quarterback position has been a position of strength, especially given the fact that Ken O'Keefe was the highest paid QBs coach in the country. That was not a position of strength. It's nothing personal against Ken O'Keefe, but they they needed change there, right? So it was an opportunity when he stepped down, whether that be because it was something that was needed or he he just that he'd given his dues to the program and he was ready to move on and take an off the field role. Regardless, it was an opportunity. I agree with you, Lemansky. It was an opportunity for Iowa to move forward and take a jump at that position. Here's the problem: they wasted that opportunity, in my opinion. Because you hire a guy who doesn't have any experience at that position. And, and I hope that Brian Ferentz does better than Ken O'Keefe. I'm not saying he's not going to do better. But the opportunity was to really upgrade at that position at, at, at that position coach spot. And instead, they, they went to a guy that's a very, very risky play. Maybe Brian Ferentz gets it done, but I don't think anybody can argue that Brian Ferentz coaching Iowa's quarterbacks is a very risky play. Can we agree with that? I don't understand the move. Well, I don't either, but I mean, I, I, I acknowledge the fact that you can't, I can't fully say it was the wrong decision until I see the results on the field. Right. I mean, I'm not going to say it's the wrong decision until I see it not work out and maybe it will work out and maybe I'll be wrong. I hope I am. I I want this to work. I don't want Iowa. If I have to watch another Iowa offense, it's 120 in the country. It's going to be a long year of post-game shows, Lemansky. All right. I'll, but yeah, I'll flip. Yeah. I'll flip it back to you. And I'm sorry for interrupting, Corey. Sure. I'm going to flip it back another way to you. Let's just forget about the quarterback position coach. I'd take one step back and look at it a broader way. It's just the offensive production for several years. Yeah, I agree. And that's that falls on one guy. I know. And and you've elevated him to now coach the the position that has been maybe at at the focal point of the struggles, right? I mean, that's right. Isn't that what happened? I'd say yes. Yeah. So I, I, I hope it works, but I, I don't believe, and I'm not saying you, you were implying this, but I don't believe that Iowa capitalized on the opportunity when Ken O'Keefe stepped down, whether it was all, it wasn't all Ken's fault. Believe me, this is not, I'm not trying to put the blame on Ken O'Keefe for all their struggles at quarterback, but they had an opportunity, as you know, to hire a guy named Randy Hedberg, who's got an unbelievable resume. They could have went out and, and contacted someone like um, the uh, kid for the guy, for, young guy from uh, I think he's at Florida International now. Yost could have gotten him. I mean, he's a guy who I'm sure I can't say with absolute certainty, but I would have I would think he would have considered coming up here to coach quarterbacks, given his resume. You know, Bill Lynch was a guy on my radar. I mean, Don Patterson's in their backyard there in Iowa City, and yeah, I get he's you know, 71, but heck, Ken O'Keefe was not much younger and Don Patterson has got quite a resume. Like my, my point is they could have went a lot of different directions. Randy Hedberg is the one that, that I'm hung up on. 
And I think a lot of fans who, who know about that are hung up on it as well. And understandably so. Maybe it'll work out, Lemansky. As far as expectations are concerned, um, I expect seven to nine wins in the regular season. I hope I'm wrong. I do think here's here if there's anything to be positive about, if that sounds lower than what your expectations are, here's what I'll say. I could see them winning the West with nine wins in the regular season. So I don't think they need to get to 10 this year to win the West because the schedules for Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin are all very difficult. Now, Purdue has the best route, in my opinion, to the West Championship. I know people are high in Nebraska. I'll never, I'm not going to say never on that. Some people are, you know, laugh at that, that, that they think Nebraska could take that big of a jump. I, I wouldn't be shocked. I also wouldn't be shocked if if they don't make a bowl game and Frost gets fired. But I do think that Iowa, Minnesota, and and Wisconsin have the three toughest schedules in this division. I do think Iowa can get to nine wins. That might be enough to get to the the championship. But those are my expectations based upon what we know, Lemansky. If if I was if I had more faith in the quarterback position, then I, I my expectations would naturally be higher, and I would probably agree with you that it's that it's championship or bust. But I just I can't get myself to expect something that I don't. I don't see as likely. So then I'll come at you at this angle, given what we got based on what coach captain Kirk said today, he has to compensate. He's got to have that defense step by one more notch, which is so unfair. And we have to have ball control. So they don't end up like against Kentucky and they're out of gas, which was Chuck Long's perception of the bowl game that, he didn't mind the punt. Let's put it on the defense. And guess what? What we all fear, they just have to do one more time, and they and they failed in the last drive and lost that bowl game, which is significant in recruiting in my mind, which is another thing to analyze where you've been and where you want to go. So what we got, what we have to bet on in Las Vegas, tongue in cheek, is that we have to have a running game. We have to offense to open holes. We got to have Williams perform at one of the highest levels in the last five years. And we have ball control, run the ball. And that's, that's what's got to happen. And that's all on captain Kirk. I agree. And there's a lot of pressure being put on that run game with two young guys. Now I have high hopes for both of them. I thought LaShawn Williams and, and um, Gavin Williams looked really good against Kentucky, but again, that was a somewhat depleted Kentucky defense. So, yeah. I mean, if you do the math, Lemansky, uh, as far as the biggest problems last year, I mean, you could, could, can we, could we say that the biggest problem in general last year was the passing game, the offensive line, and the run game? I know those all work hand in hand together. And again, I know I'm kind of saying well, that's the whole offense. Well, the, the run game wasn't good the pass game wasn't good and the offensive line wasn't good. That's that. That's why you were 120th in the country in total offense. And so steps forward at each of those positions, we talked about the quarterback position, but you lose Tyler Goodson um, and Ivory Kelly Martin. And I know Kelly Martin wasn't great last year, had problems with ball security, but yeah, you're putting it on the backs of a couple of young guys and a couple of freshmen coming in and an offensive line that's losing three guys, including one of the best players that's ever played here in Tyler Linderbaum. So yeah, I would say you're you're spot on. I think that that's you're putting you're putting a heavy load on other positions and other coaches. And the defense has been you you brought that up too. The defense has been dealing with that load for years. Um, and somehow the defense gets blamed at times. I think of the 2015 championship game against Michigan State, and that was not a bad offense, but it wasn't a great offense, even though they had CJ Beathard and the defense just couldn't hold on that final play. Same with 2017 at home against Penn State. The final pass from McSorley to Juwan Johnson. Just that one play on fourth down. Couldn't quite get it done. And it, you just leave so little margin for error for your defense when your offense is consistently getting off the field. Three and outs and and uh, you know, even turnovers last year. I mean, Petrus was 10, 10 touchdowns in the year, nine interceptions. Those aren't, even, those aren't good numbers for a, a quarterback or, excuse me, a head coach that wants – uh, ball security and consistency back there. I mean, he, that's not game manager. Those aren't game manager numbers. You don't throw ten touchdowns to nine picks and say that's a good that's a good performance as a game manager. So you're right. There's a there's a heavy load on special teams unit and on defense. Well, you beat me to my next comment because you knew where you were last year, and so I guess if you had the opportunity for moves, and I guess in my mind, 
not enough good moves were made. Now you put pressure. You may, you know, I can see where you say, okay, we got Wampa. We've got recruiting going on defensive end. We got the right defensive coach. We'll be good or even better. Well, now the other thing you've done as a head coach and years of experience, what is our, where's our field goal kicker going to be next year? And I tell you what, if we didn't have the field goal kicking performance last year and it goes downhill this year, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to sleep very well in the fall. I know. I have to go fishing. (laughs) You and me both, man. I I, I agree with you. You took the words right off my tongue because I've I've said that. I said that this is past week to someone that they better hope they can figure out place kicking because, man, you you are absolutely right. Imagine you didn't have Caleb Shudak, who was, by the way, one of the best kickers in the country last year. You ain't getting to 10 wins. I'll tell you that. You ain't winning the West without Caleb Shudak. So, you know, uh, Drew Stevens has shown promise. I know he's got a big leg. I've been told he can kick from 60 yards. Um, Blom doesn't quite have the range that that Drew Stevens has. They're missing Amaya, who's out with a, with a, with a leg injury for several months. So, you know, but the consistency is going to be the problem for Blom and, and Drew Stevens. And from what I've heard, consistency – is pretty much even there. Those guys are going to be battling this fall. Um, but the one advantage that the young guy, Drew Stevens, has over Blom is that he's got a bigger leg. I will give you one more thing, and then I'll get off the line, is that, uh, and you can agree, disagree, you can have your own view. I think the litmus test for the next fall when be when the Michigan Wolverines come into Kinnick, we have home field, and a lot of uh, pundits and even people I've heard talk about you know, how many games is Michigan going to lose? And everybody's saying Michigan game in Iowa City is going to be tough. And if they lose that game, to me, that, that says a lot about where we're at. I think that's a really key game. And maybe maybe we won't have a lot. Maybe we'll be sitting backwards and wins and losses. But hopefully we've got a good win-loss record and can take that game. Because if we don't, that's a pretty good litmus test where this program is and where we can go the year after it. Agreed. And I think there's a good chance, Lemansky, that I was – well, let me pull up their schedule. I think there's a good chance they're at least 4-0. and um, Let me pull up the schedule here. Cause they, you don't were, think the Cyclones are going to be motivated with the coaching staff they got? That's going to be a that's gonna be a field goal kick. They're just losing a lot, though, Lemansky, and they're having to come to Kinnick. I yeah. like your positivity. I hope yeah. you're right. No, I'm not saying I've that got, Iowa State I've got can't. too many Cyclone friends, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that Iowa State can't win, but I'm just saying you're in Kinnick, you're you're down Purdy, you're down Brees Hall, they're down a lot of guys. I mean that that roster is took a big hit, and we have no idea what mm-hmm. Iowa State's going to look like at quarterback right now. So I mean, you get South Dakota State, Iowa State, Nevada, Rutgers. I mean that's I think they got a good chance of being four and zero, but then you get a bye week, and then you go you you stay at home for the Michigan game. So I think you're right that that October first game is going to be a litmus test. Um, I think they'll be 4-0 at that point. I'll give you a funny rivalry story. I, I've got a lot of friends went to Iowa State because of my farming background. And I, I've been to several uh, Cyclone games at Chack Trice with a room full of Cyclones. i got to keep my mouth kind of shut, but of course it, it, it says a few things now and then. So a few years ago, Iowa beat Iowa State at Ames, and we're riding back in there through 35 North and the, it was a it was a Dodge a Durango. A lot of people in the car, and they said it was something I thought was unfactual about the hawk. So I said something. And the car pulled over on the side of the road, and my best friend for years said, "Get out of the car and walk home." Then, and we were about <laughs> south of Mason City, and I had about uh, two hours to get home. And I got out of the car and walked on the side of the road, and Durango took off down the road, and I started looking back to Hitch, and all of a sudden the Durango. Uh, pulled over and he waited for me to get up there and let me back in. He said, you'll be quiet the rest of the way home. And so that Iowa state, Iowa game is pretty important to me. You, you were, you were on I-35. Yep. Going North after the game. That's a beautiful story. Lemansky. That's just how <laughs> intense this rivalry is. And he's one of my best friends from high school. I'm doing it forever. Worked with him in business. And, and I said, are you serious? You're going to dump me off on I-35. And he said, well, you should have drove. Get the hell out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I I, uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly that the Iowa State-Iowa rivalry is a uh, great, great rivalry. I know people don't like it because, well, in the past they haven't liked it because they think Iowa State 
damages Iowa's schedule, strength of schedule. That's not the case anymore. I do think Iowa State's going to take a step back, but I do think Campbell, he's he's going to be here for a while, I think. Uh, and uh, as long as he's here, they're going to be relevant. So I agree. Uh, that should be a good game, but I like Iowa's chances in Kinnick. And uh, I just want to tell your listening audience, I root for the Panthers. My high school, uh, the guy that went to my high school, Mark Farley from Wacon, is the head coach. He's done a hell of a job with the Panthers, and I want to salute him on the air, and I'll hang up and listen to the rest of the show. All right. Appreciate it, Lomansky. Appreciate the call. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. Desmond Upshaw is here. He says, uh, a good uh, partner of Mark Rogers, he says it'll be nice to have a chat during the regular season this year for the Iowa-Michigan game. And um, I'm sure I'm going to get ripped if I uh, make any suggestion that Iowa could win that game. Not by you, Desmond, although I don't think you agreed with my estimation last year, and uh, but that's fine. That's why it's an opinion. Um, that's gonna be that's gonna be a fun pregame uh, warm up, Desmond. I, I do think that's gonna be fun. Uh, if you tried to call as Lomansky was on the line, go ahead and give us a call back, and we do have another call here coming in. Thank you for calling from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Who's on the line? Mark. Mark, how are you? Fine. Good. Oh, um, I'll get right. I'll get right to it. Sure. Uh, I just checked the Las Vegas Raiders official website. They have yet to hire a tight ends coach. Correct. My theory is it's going to be Brian Ferentz and John Budmeyer will take over as offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach. And that is one reason he's worked the past month uh volunteer because okay. he knows this job is coming up for him okay here here's my question mark and i'm 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 not telling you you're wrong because i've had the same thought in the past um i thought it was first of all if you watched my show mark i don't know how long you've watched this show this channel but you probably knew that the day brian ferentz was announced as the next quarterbacks coach um i was uh I thought it was absurd, to put it lightly. I thought it was absolutely absurd. And I'm aware of that. I, I Here's what I'll say. Uh, I was looking for answers. I was looking for explanations. I remember coming up with that theory that perhaps this is a strategic move to make it appear that um, Brian is very much in the good graces of the fan base, even though we know he's not at current, at present. And when that Raiders job opens up, even though he was named quarterbacks coach here, he will jump to the NFL to be a tight ends coach. I guess my, my big thing on that, um, not saying it's impossible, but why is Las Vegas taking so long to name a tight ends coach? I mean, if, if this was a done deal, if this was known months ago, why, why the pause? Why the delay? I mean, we, we've got spring practice is a really important time for these guys, especially quarterbacks. Why would you not want to have... John Budmeyer, by the rules, cannot work strategically with these and tactically with the players. That's according to the UI compliance office. So why why the wait if you're Las Vegas to hire a tight ends coach? Because of the wait till John Budmeyer became available, which was not until mid-January. And till uh, Coach Ferentz, Kirk, uh, uh, found a offensive coordinator like John, who is familiar with tight end offenses, Wisconsin, Colorado State, fullbacks, Wisconsin, Colorado State, and has time to watch the team as a volunteer during spring practice and make some mental evaluations of how he's going to approach it when he takes over, when Brian signs his contract with the Raiders uh, in a few days here, because the NFL draft is April 28th. So it was Iowa's decision. It was John Budmeyer not being available until so late. March 1st. Yeah, he started Iowa here. I thought they could make that move. Yeah, he started here March 1st. But So are you saying that you think this move is going to happen in the next few days? Yes. Okay. Well, time will tell. Uh, I have no problem with you going out on a limb and saying that, Mark, because 
I have had that theory. I, I've questioned that before. Um, but it, it, I don't know. I think the theory does have a couple holes, but if it happens, it happens. Is it possible the Raiders just are not going to hire a tight ends coach? Is that possible? I mean, I don't know. It's possible, but I do believe most every NFL team has a tight ends coach. Yeah, that I that I don't know. You could be right on that. Um, yeah, I I I just um, I'll believe it when I see it. I, I part of me hopes you're right. I just I still would wonder. I, I still wonder John Budmeyer being here in the spring and not able to work hands on with players all spring. Uh, you know, I understand he'd be getting to know the player. He can get to know the players and he can get to know the, the coaching staff, but to have him working here all spring without being able to work with the players, then all of a sudden he's taken over for fall camp and for summer. That's a bit odd, but we'll see. Time will tell. You're right. The draft is uh, Thursday. Okay. That's my only comment. And uh, I'll listen to the rest of the show. Appreciate the call, Mark. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a, I have no problem with the, the theory. You know, it's not one of those things that people say, uh, you know, so, so, so something's going to happen at some point. We just don't know when because you can always just keep moving the needle and saying, well, it hadn't happened yet. It's going to happen. He's right. I mean, if, if that's the theory and that's going to happen, it's going to happen within the next few days, then we're going to find out. I, I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, I, that's just me. I don't believe that's going to happen. At one time, I wondered because I just thought that mainly because I just thought the move was absurd. I really did at the time. I thought it was absolutely absurd. I also thought I've been following the Raiders uh, t- uh, coaching hires as well, just like Mark was. And I I did think it was odd that, that Las Vegas continued to not hire a tight ends coach. Um, So, yeah, we'll see. That's a I'm, that's an interesting comment from Mark. Let's take our next call here. Thank you for calling from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Who's on the line? Hello, Corey. It's the real MVP. How are you doing this uh, beautiful Saturday uh, evening slash afternoon? Well, I'm doing – and this is the the real, not the fake MVP, correct? No, this is the real Okay. Just want to make sure. Uh, I'm doing good. Um, I'm happy to be able to talk about spring fo- – I'm happy to talk about football and have a bunch of people here uh, – chiming in and uh interested in in this roster and you know we've got some conspiracy theories about the offense so it wouldn't be iowa football in the spring without some concerns some some uh sugar coating which is what the media did a lot today and i understand that's part of the the job and certainly uh the the theories are are entertaining so and we got the draft in a few days so i'm i'm uh, excited and i'm excited to watch nba playoffs later it's a uh, at least we have some sports here. I'm not a big baseball guy, drill MVP, so I, I latch on to the NBA playoffs, the NFL draft, spring football, because then once we hit June, there's just not much to uh, keep me going sports-wise until we hit September. Yeah, I mean, I've been watching the USFL as well and that combination of sports you've been mentioning. Got a grasping at straws here, Corey, is how I describe it these times of month. It's, so uh, not good. Em- Drew MVP, let me ask you before you get on with your question, if you had a question, um, you, you probably heard our last caller and his theory that um, Brian Ferentz is going to leave for the NFL in a few days. And again, this is not my theory. This is our caller, Mark, who brought this up. But uh, he believes that Brian Ferentz is going to leave for the NFL for the Raiders tight end job here in a few days before the NFL draft. And John Budmeyer being on staff as an assistant, a volunteer assistant, um, he's going to be the next offensive coordinator here. And what are your thoughts on that that uh, conspiracy theory? Well, anything is possible. That's where I'll start with that. So it's not the craziest thing I've ever heard. The only thing I don't understand is why you wouldn't just go a few months without offensive coordinator or have the intern tag on Brian Ferris and then wait till John Bunmeyer becomes the OC. Well, frankly, that's Drew- the- Drill MVP. I'm I'm excited. John Budmeyer is here. If he can help quarterbacks again, I think he's limited with what he can do as an unpaid assistant. But if he was the next uh, coordinator slash QBs coach, I would be like, I mean, this is going to sound like I'm being Debbie Downer, but I'd be like, that was the best we could do. John Budmeyer. I mean, I have no. He's got a decent resume, but there aren't guys out there that have better resumes that could resurrect this offense. 
I think as well, a quarterback's coach, there probably he would do is, just fine, but. But I think between him and Brian, I think it's pretty obvious which Absolutely. direction most people want to go in. Absolutely. And I think there's some cope that is going on with this conspiracy theory as well. I, because people just don't want to take face value. Hey, we're going to have the 115th best offense in the country. Yay, type thing. So they're trying to explain it by connecting dots that may not be connected. But time will tell if it's true or not. It certainly will. So the thing I'd like to say is, why, how come Iowa's spring practice, just naming a spring game, getting on the Big Ten Network, you don't have to play no contact or anything like that. You can have running clock. But get eyeballs on Iowa football. Get the fans to be excited to come to your game. Have talk about them. Instead, it's just kind of, on the, uh, hey, this is something we did type thing, but nobody's really going to pay attention to us. Well, I guess I should know the TV. answer to this, but maybe there is there. Does anybody know if there's any coverage on BTN, like any recorded um, segment? Every spring game is on Big Ten Network. But this isn't a spring game. I'm talking about the spring it, practice. This is not. So what I'm saying is, is is there some recorded footage that BTN is going to, to air? I don't know the answer to that question. I should know that, but um, I, I just without having a formal game, I don't know how you air that. Right. Well, I think, I mean, my point is just make it a game. Just make yeah, it agree. a game. I agree. And then I heard that, uh, I haven't, I haven't heard a lot because I just haven't seen any footage or anything, which would be valuable, but I heard, uh, the third string quarterback that everybody wants to start. He did pretty well against the third string defense. Okay. So yeah. that was good. Against the third string defense, right? I mean, you know, I mean, maybe he is. I mean, maybe he's the guy, but, um, you know, you're not you're not going to know until we hit fall. I will say this: Kirk was asked about that position, and I brought this up earlier in the show, and he was asked, frankly, who's the front runner right now? Or I guess the question was was couched: Is Spencer Petrus still the front runner at this point? And Kirk said yes, but then he he made sure to bring up the fact that it's an open competition, and I. I maybe I'm making too much of that. I just I, I it, it does bug me when I hear any of the coaches say, um, "Well, he's the number one guy, but it's an open competition." Because if it's an open competition, why do we have to say he's the number one guy? What's the point of that? I just don't know. Maybe I'm making too much of it, but um, you know, Labus needs to get, and if he didn't this spring, then shame on the coaches. And I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt that he did get equal reps against equal competition. But that's the need. He needs to be able to get equal reps against equal competition. That doesn't mean uh, him playing with a third string offense against a third string defense. That is not fair to Joey Labus. And if he doesn't know the offense by now, then we have a problem because he's been here how long? Let me pull up. Let me pull up uh, when he got here because everybody talks about how young he is. Joey Labus uh, got here. I want to say he got here. Am I right in saying he got here last? I think he got here last spring, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I forget that uh, the University of Iowa has him listed as a WB. Though they don't have him listed as a QB, they have him listed as a WB. What's a WB, Jarrell MVP? I don't know. <laughs> okay, so they've got him listed as a WB, and he got here in... Uh, it doesn't say, actually. Maybe he did get here in the fall, but I... I uh, I just don't remember. But my point is he should be getting up to speed to the point where I would think that, you know, this offense, everybody talks about this offense being so hard to learn. And I'm sure, you know, there's some, some substance to that, but man, you have an entire season here and now you have an entire spring. I would have to think by now you're almost, you're pretty much up to speed. You know, you're not going to yeah, get I game action. You're not going to know what it's like to play in a game until you've played in a game. So I'd hope mm -hmm. I'd like to hope that that Joey Labus is in a position now where he he's he could go out there tomorrow and play in a game. Now maybe he'd maybe I'm sure he'd make mistakes. Young guys are going to make mistakes, but I would just have to hope with the bowl prep last year and fall camp, and now you got all of spring practice complete that he's got to be getting close. Yeah, I mean a year and a half, you should know most of the stuff in there, 
and especially for I know I was said to have a complex system, but they don't. They run a lot of short and medium routes, and then there's um, there's a lot of intricacies and small details. But it's not exactly like you know trick plays and gadget plays and all that type of stuff. So I think he can get enough of the basic down, especially at this point, to where he can be serviceable if he was needed for a series or two. I think most fans want him more in a series. I'll say this. Um, I saw somebody on Twitter during the game tweeted out um, Spencer Petrus looking really good so far, and the video was him dropping back and throwing like a three-yard out. Well, so. I, I, I don't want you to go on on and drink, Corey, but <laughs> I'm just saying, I mean, you know, let's, we're just not going to know people. I don't, I, not that I'm not saying I don't trust people and I don't trust the media. I'm not saying that, but the media's job is to hype things up. And this wasn't a media person that tweeted that out, but um, we, it's just going to be wait until fall and what, wait until September. I'm not, I mean, I don't even care what the hype around fall camp is because I remember two years ago, I, I remember a former player, a former Iowa player, talking about how much better Spencer Petrus was than Nate Stanley. Okay, I'm not gonna say who that former mm-hmm. player was, but I remember a former player saying that Spencer Petrus was gonna be better than Nate Stanley. He throws darts, um, he's accurate. Has you you've watched Iowa football, Drill MVP? Has Spencer Petrus ever been better than Nate Stanley? I uh, no, no, uh, and Nate Stanley wasn't great. I'm not saying that, but he certainly has performed at a higher performed at a higher level than Spencer Petrus has. So I just, I'm, I used to buy into that as a fan. I used to buy into all the hype. I read every article, listened to every podcast I could. And I heard what I wanted to hear. I want, I, I took in what I wanted to hear and I've gotten to the point anymore where I just don't. Um, I, I just, I would much rather wait till fall. And I, I love talking about, it. I think it's really healthy people be able to have these conversations. I think that's good for the fan base, but, I'm not going to buy into all the hype that Joey Labus is the next best thing or that Spencer Petrus has taken a huge jump. You know, I remember reading last year, a year ago, that uh, Tony Rassiope had said that a year ago, Spencer Petrus was, you know, he was primed to take a huge jump into 2021. And he frankly did not. So I just, well, let's just wait and see what happens. Well, you know, it's been a, you, it's been pretty down these last few minutes. So I'll give you, I'll give you some hope, Corey, okay? I'll sure. give you some realistic hope. So I've got Iowa's schedule pulled up. Okay. For the 2022 season and I'll be the I think I'll be the first to predict they will be undefeated until their bye week. Well, so I just every predict, game. I just predicted that like 15 minutes ago on the show uh through MVP. Oh. <laughs> so you have them beating Michigan? No, no. No, their bye week. Let me pull up their bye week. That's before Michigan. Is after Michigan, excuse me. They get um, South Dakota, Iowa State, Nevada, at Rutgers, Michigan, and at Illinois. Okay, you're right. I'm, I'm sorry. I read that wrong. There is no bye week. But I know I have them going 4-0. Oh. I don't have them. So you have them beating Michigan. That's the difference. You have them yeah. beating Michigan. The bye week is before the Ohio State game, correct? Yes. Um. And- yeah, I've got I've got them beating I've got I mean I haven't made my this is not nothing official, but just glancing at the schedule. They'll beat South Dakota State, although I think South Dakota State's better than people think. That could be a dangerous game, but I think they'll win. Iowa State at home. I give Iowa the edge. Never say never. Nevada, Jay Jay Norvell's gone. That was a good team last year, as you know, that's a bowl team, but Iowa should win. They should win at Rutgers, who was a bowl team at five and seven. Iowa should win that game. You're four and oh. Yeah, Michigan at home. I'm not going to predict a win at that at this juncture. Uh, and then at Illinois is going to be a tough one. I don't know how much of a jump Illinois will make. I know they lost a lot with the transfer portal, but it's Bielema's second year there. But I, I would give Iowa the edge. So I see four and zero, five and one at first glance heading into the bye week. Well, Michigan. The reason I give it to Iowa is for Michigan. It's a tricky spot to be in every, every time going at Iowa, especially right. at night. That's a very very difficult place to play. And I think I think Michigan may be a top ten team, but I think that'll be kind of like a smoke screen. I think they'll be massively overrated. Like I could see Michigan being nine and three, eight and four this year. So I think the value of Michigan, they beat Ohio State, yes. They won the Big Ten title, yes, but 
a lot of those star players that was key for Michigan are leaving. And I think with Jim Harbaugh's mindset, he's, I don't know how he's going to recover to his team because he's tried to hook every NFL job available under the sun and he couldn't get any of them. I don't know how he can come back to his team and be like, you know what? Michigan's the place where I want to be. And we're going to go win the Big Ten title again. I just, I, I just don't believe in them at all. Well, as you're talking here, I, uh, Drill MVP, I did just pop up the schedule for people who aren't aware of what we're, what we're talking about. Let me zoom in here so people can see it. Um, I think the Michigan game comes at a really good time because there's going to be a lot of momentum. I'm not saying that that, that means you're going to win, but I do think momentum is a good thing. And Iowa wrote it for well, how many games last year? Um, the schedule, I think it shapes up positively. You're not going to get any momentum um, on the road. I mean, Rutgers on the road, that, you know, you're know, you not going to get much of an environment, but you get Michigan at home. That's the key. Obviously, I'm not going to predict Iowa is going to beat Ohio State. Um, no. you know, But Illinois and Rutgers, your first two road games are very w- much winnable. Your toughest road yeah. games are at Ohio State, at Purdue, at Minnesota, and those all come in late October to November. So I just I like that setup more as, as it relates to the schedule, having being able to to build yourselves, build some confidence early at home and against maybe the the more favorable road environments and then be able to to uh, get into November and, and kind of take the home stretch and give yourself a chance. That way you're in the race. If you're eliminated from the race early, if you're playing Ohio State, Michigan, Wisconsin back to back to back early, I think that from a from a uh, psyche standpoint can can hurt. I think the schedule's set up well. And remember the schedule was revamped a couple months ago by the Big Ten Conference. And I think that's actually a positive for Iowa. Yeah, I think the at Purdue road game will be the most important game of the season. If they win that, they win the Big Ten West. At Purdue on the road. Yep. Um the- Yeah, I, I I you know I, I'm not gonna I won't go through and pick everything right now, but I, I can say privately I've done that <laughs> with some some uh, I've done that with Mark and I've done that with with Don Patterson. Just my own opinion on looking at the schedule, and I'll, I'll produce a video here at some point this spring or this this summer and, and talk about my early predictions. But I do think that Purdue game is big, and it's also going to be sort of a litmus test for Iowa um, with Tra- with Tyrone Tracy transferring to Purdue, and there was quite a bit of hype in West Lafayette about Tracy and how he's been performing kind of running a hybrid role running back slash wide receiver role with, with, with the, uh, um, Boilermakers. And so it will be interesting to see. And yeah, the last time Iowa went to Purdue, they lost. In fact, they've lost. I mean, they lose right. Re- As you know, they lose regularly to Purdue. So yeah, you're right. That's going to be, who knows what Northwestern is going to be. I mean, maybe Pat Fitzgerald doesn't turn that thing around, but boy, it seems like every year they're every other, year they're winning a championship so they could go from being bottom feeders last year to being one of the best teams in the west and if that's the case man this this schedule turns into a gauntlet late october into november yeah their first half of the schedule versus their second half of the schedule is night and day no comparison what right if you win three maybe four games in the second half of this schedule i was going to be a fantastic team it oh yeah almost impossible i would say to even go with one loss in that second half of the schedule and i think nebraska is going to be i i know i don't know how you feel about nebraska i think nebraska is going to be a lot better um yeah you know i I just uh, i i could be wrong you know we thought they were going to be better last year and they were close i do think their work that they've done in the transfer portal has been positive i know the other side of it you know you can argue that the reason they had to go to the portals because they lost a lot in the portal that's true but they also gained some really good players, starting with their with the most important position on the field. They uh, nabbed two quarterbacks, one of which was maybe the best statistical passer in the Big Twelve Conference last year in Casey Thompson. So, and you have a quarterbacks coach now finally in Mark Whipple. So, I, I, I Nebraska is dangerous, and who knows what they're going to be late in you know late October. Um, yeah, if they if they just get over that hump and win one game against a close. Uh, in a close competition, they'll be really good, but it's all mental for them. They can compete with anybody in the country. I agree. Which, I mean, well, well, I mean, they almost, they competed, almost beat Oklahoma. They only lost Ohio state by nine. They're, yeah. They were unbelievably talent wise. They just, 
for some reason, they could never have the ball bounce their way when it came late and down the game. And, and let's remember, they get Oklahoma again. So you win that game against Oklahoma, which is, I wouldn't say it's likely, but so say you shock the world and beat Oklahoma. Boy, Big Red Nation's going to be bonkers and who knows oh, yeah. it'll be the best it'll be the best team or the most hype they've had probably in like 15 years yes and i i think that this i think the west race this year will be the best race it's been since the beginning of the divisions i think the race will be as oh. competitive as it's ever been yeah well um iowa can win it wisconsin can win it purdue can win it i can even see minnesota winning it this year well, and there's people who are predicting Nebraska is going to win it. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm not going out on that ledge right now. But there are people out there predicting that Nebraska wins the division. So you, again, you just you just never know. And Northwestern's won it more as much as Iowa has over the past ten to fifty, you know, ten or so years since we started. Well, uh, Corey, that's all I got for you today. It was good talking to you, man. Appreciate you, real MVP. Thanks for the call as always, Ooh. and. Um, all good stuff. I, and I love looking at the schedule. I promise we're going to look at the schedule more this summer. Um, we're going to have a lot of time. And by the way, I just want to say this, do a little promotion here for a second. Plenty of content coming this summer as it relates to, to football, to basketball. I see a comment here about baseball. Um, let me address that for a second. Bud says, how about the baseball team, though? One versus Rutgers last night up 9-0 today through, through six innings. I appreciate you bringing this up, Bud. And I am sad to say I'm not as big of a baseball, Iowa baseball follower. Um, I'm not a huge baseball guy in general. I can tell you this, bud, that uh, I will try to do some postseason coverage for, for Iowa baseball. I wanted to do that for Iowa wrestling. And then the problem is Iowa wrestling is competing with Iowa men's and women's basketball. And if you followed the show, you know, I was on a lot during the postseason. So appreciate this update. And I do have high hopes for the team with Brody Brecht and, Isaiah Fillard and just everybody on that team, but um, we'll just have to wait and see where they end up in, in the Big Ten tournament. Um, I don't believe everybody, if I'm correct in saying this, I don't believe everybody makes the Big Ten tournament in baseball, but I do believe I was in a good position. I know kind of a slow start to the year, but but they certainly have bounced back. Bradley says we'll beat Michigan and lose to Illinois. Uh, I would rather lose to Illinois, I think, than I'd let, rather lose to Michigan. Uh, maybe that's reverse. Maybe I'm I'm turned around, but uh, I don't know. I don't think losing at Illinois is going to be a bad thing in a year or two. I don't. I don't know what Bielema is going to have this year in the Illini, but I do think he's going to get things done. Whether that means six and six, seven and five consistently, I think the the ceiling is much higher on Illinois. Um, Howard says, "I say I will. I say I will. Will beat. Okay, he's correcting it. Sorry about that, Howard. I say Iowa will beat." Michigan and Ohio State. Uh, well, you can say that, Hawkeye Howard, and you were right. You remember, I remember Hawkeye Howard was one of the first people to watch our post game show last year, and he, I remember him making the comment that Iowa was going to go twelve and zero, and through eight games, you were right, Hawkeye Howard. I think it was eight games, right? Um, but I am not going to go that far. Um, I think Iowa can win one of those games. I, I think they have a much better chance against Michigan. I think that's obvious, but they do get a bye week before Ohio state. I will say last year, they did not benefit from a bye week before Minnesota, uh, the Wisconsin game. And that Wisconsin game was maybe Iowa's worst performance of the year. And Purdue was right up there with it. And so was the big 10 championship game. But, um, you know, they, they need to utilize that bye week heading into the Ohio state game game this year, because they did not do a very good job doing that last year. Um, I'm missing a couple comments. Sorry to skip over you, Thomas. He says, can Iowa beat Michigan in October? Sure. Yeah, they can. Um, you know, I think Michigan's got some questions to answer. I still wonder. It was brought up by our caller earlier, but I, I do wonder what the what the attitude of this team is going to be. Um, you know, just with the offseason rumors with Jim Harbaugh, and it sounded like he wanted to go to the NFL, wanted to play or wanted to coach for Minnesota and ends up coming back to be the Wolverines coach. You know, does that hurt their, their momentum? It can't help, I don't think. Um, so I, I do think Iowa can beat them. They've beaten them in Kinnick before. Seems like more often than not, they beat them in Kinnick, at least during this century. But um, certainly uh, Michigan's going to ha have a lot returning. I mean, they're a playoff team last year, and, and they'll have a lot returning, but they lose some as well. So Iowa will have a shot. Uh, Bud says uh, uh, Kirk Ferentz is und undefeated against Campbell. 
And I think that'll continue. I'm not going to lock any picks in right now, but I do think Iowa's got a good sh- chance at winning that game in Kinnick this year and going 4-0 to start. Courtney says, uh, I'm late to the party. Did you already talk about how awesome LaShawn Williams looked today? I have not, Courtney. I appreciate you bringing this up. Um, and I will say this. I, I have not looked at much tape from today yet. Um, for anybody just joining, I was not able to attend the game today. I had some some therapy for my my shoulder. I would have loved to have gone. Um, we, we wanted to go, but I had to pri- prioritize my own health uh, and therapy. So was not able to make it. But I do know that uh, there have been a lot of positive comments, not only today, but throughout spring practice about those two guys, Gavin and LaShawn Williams. And I've been positive about both of them. I like the freshman Iowa have, has coming in with Jazzy and Patterson and Caleb Johnson. And they need depth of that position. Devin Hilson's out. He was out today with an injury. You know, will he stay at running back long term? I don't have the answer to that. Um, you know, they've looked in the portal at that position, but have not gotten anybody. So, yes, I, I like LaShawn Williams. I think he's a little bit more, a little bit more versatile than a guy like Gavin. But Gavin's got some speed, too. These guys are kind of your tweener backs, especially LaShawn and the two guys they have coming in. Gavin, I think, is your more of your prototypical downhill runner, but he can, he can move as well. I like both of those guys heading into fall health is going to be primary concern because that's one of the thinnest positions on this roster that and tight end very, very thin. Uh, and at least until we get to fall camp. Right. And I know we're moving into the strength and conditioning phase of things here soon. Um, but depth is depth is a concern at, uh, at running back. Um, just trying to scroll through here and make sure that uh, I'm not missing anybody. Bradley says if Padilla is our starter, we're in for a long year. I would throw Labus in and say, show what you can do, kid. We'll see if Kirk, try- we'll see if Kirk and Brian and whoever else is on staff at the time. Uh, we'll see who trusts who, right? I mean, I, I just, if Labus isn't ready to go by, by September, I mean, and I say ready to go, I'm not saying he needs to be better than, I mean, may the best guy win, right? But if he's not ready because he doesn't know the offense or he doesn't know how to, you know, go through pre-snap stuff, shame on the coaches because that's, uh, you know, over a year. If, if we get to sept- early September and he still doesn't know what's going on, we got to figure things out about how to simplify things for our guys, specifically at the quarterback position. Um, I agree with you. I think Labus um, probably is the one guy that fans are banking on because it's not just me. Fans are... A lot of fans are distressed and downtrodden about the fact that that Brian Ferentz is coaching quarterbacks. Um, And the fact that, I I don't know, I don't hear this as much. I know people who've watched my show know that I feel very strongly that Iowa should have went to the transfer portal at quarterback. There were lots of options. And don't tell me that everybody that was in the portal were guys that had lost their jobs wherever they were playing before. That's not the case. That's simply wrong. Okay. The simple fact is there were proven guys who left for various reasons. Casey Thompson left from Texas. Yes, I know Quinn Ewers transferred in, but he was available. You had Jaden Delora, who was uh, an offensive fresh or offensive was an offensive freshman of the year, I believe. Offensive freshman of the year in the Pac-12. He ends up transferring to uh, Arizona, who was a total. I mean, they that's maybe the worst team in the FBS, maybe in the FBS, at least in the Power Five last year. You know, I mean, there was. The kid from uh, Auburn, Bo Nix, he goes to Oregon. You've got uh, JT Daniels. He heads to West Virginia. Okay. You just go down the list. There have been a lot of guys. Now, Emory Jones is still out there from Florida. Tyson Fumichon's out there. Fumichon has not proven himself. Emory Jones, you could argue, has. His numbers are impressive. I know Florida fans aren't high on Emory Jones, and I think probably part of that is because he's leaving. But he did produce in a very, very difficult conference at Florida. I always made it clear, though, they're not interested in that in in upgrading at that position because I don't think they. I, I guess it's because they don't feel the need. I, I I disagree, but that's been one of my bigger complaints. Um, Lomansky says optimistic thought Williams duo would be the second coming of Nile Kinnick. I hope they're that good. I really do. Um, Erica says. It's do or die for Nebraska. They'll lose face completely if they have a similar crap season again. Bradley says, where did Martinez end up? He went to it got Kansas State, actually, and, and Kansas State, that's another one. I mean, I didn't bring him up, and I'm not saying Iowa should have went after him. The rumor was his girlfriend was at Kansas State, and that was a factor. But 
Wh- who would you rather have as your quarterback, Spencer Petrus or Adrian Martinez? I mean, just answer the question. Maybe, maybe you would say Petrus. I would probably lean towards Martinez, but there, there were better options out there. I mean, Martinez, uh, we'll see what he does at Kansas State with a good quarterback coach. Uh, I believe it's Klein, right? The former uh, Kansas State standout, I think. Um, so we'll see. And um, he's got great athleticism, great upside, but uh, struggled to secure and, and protect the football at Nebraska. D-Dub says, Kirk just sounds like he says the same thing at each and every press conference, aside from a few different switch-ups. Yeah, that's that's coach speak, right? And we heard that today. A lot of positive things about guys, but, you know, we're working, we're... we're I, I just don't read into it much anymore, D-Dub, because, yeah, we're working. We're, we're pushing forward. We really got to push forward at this point. You know, it's really about moving forward and, you know, moving the moving the chains and, you know, whatever. I, I it, Listen, he's got to do those press conferences. He's not – he'd probably prefer not to. But, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's not going to give you any extra information you don't need. That's for sure. And there weren't – I mean, I listened to the press conference, and it's nothing – it's not a knock on the media. There were no tough questions today, and, and there probably shouldn't have been. There's nothing really – I mean, I, I think that you're always you always should be up for tough tough questions, but today was you know kind of celebrating the end of spring practice, and I get that. That's that's just how it's going to be. Uh, Howard says, Hawkeye Howard says, Nebraska is a wannabe team. Always be wanted to be to uh, be a team. Like I said, if they were in the race for the Western winner, West, I shave my head. He shaves his head. You're going to shave your head, okay? Thank you for that information, <laughs> Hawkeye Howard. Um. Hawkeye Howard says, "If Iowa wins the Big Ten West, then he shaves his head." All right, uh, we'll we'll take that. We'll uh, I'll bank on that deal. Uh, the super fan disciple, as as usual, Iowa's defense will be heavily relied on to win those games. If Iowa could average thirty one points a game, we'd be in the Big Ten championship game year in and year out. Not going to disagree with that at all. Erica says, uh, "For that to happen, we need to change their style of play." Uh, I think there's going to be some changes. Let me say that first. Let me highlight that for a second. I I do believe, I said this to Mark the other day, there will be changes made, specifically with how Iowa attacks offensively, because I think Kirk, this is the one positive takeaway from Brian taking over basically everything right now. He's taking over quarterbacks. He's taking over the offense in general. He's got full reins to the offense at this point. My perception of this is he is going to change things I don't think they're going to just draft. I don't think it's going to be an overhaul, but I do believe that Brian and Kirk recognize it's now or never, right? Kirk has doubled down on his son and they realize that something has to change or Brian's not gonna be able to come back next year. He's just not going to be able to, if, if things are a disaster this year, forget it. So I do think by Kirk promoting Brian, it's opened up for a bit of a style change. It's not going to, they're not going to be going spread and, and, you know, going triple option every play. But they are going to, I think, throw the ball downfield more. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see some some different plays. And that's listen, I remember Don Patterson saying this on the air, and it's he wasn't it wasn't anything personal against Brian or anybody, but I remember him saying on the air that Iowa probably needs to have more plays in the playbook. And that sounds simple, but it it really is involved. You really have to work at that. And I think they're gonna I think they're gonna run more plays. I think we're gonna see a different different style of attack at times. Their, their bread and butter is still going to be the run. You know, will they be able to run effectively with the zone scheme? I don't know. I hope so. I think they've got good running backs and, and offensive linemen with potential, but I do think we're going to see some changes because I think they have to. I think Brian's not dumb. Kirk's not dumb. They know it's now or never to get some headway with this offense. Kurt says, anybody have a link to today's practice? I don't. I'm guessing that uh, somebody will have a, a, a link to that here at some point. I, I, plan on scouring the interwebs to uh, to find as much footage as I can this weekend. Um, Bradley says, I'm a huge Kirk backer for what he has meant to the program, but when Deuce entered the portal, I was extremely angry with Kirk for not giving him a shot. I wasn't angry, but I'm disappointed by it. I thought it was an inappropriate comment at the time that Kirk made that kind of sealed the deal on him leaving, not saying that was the only reason why he left. But I would have at least liked to have seen Deuce in a game, right? In an actual game where he's getting, as I said before, equal reps against equal opportunity. And maybe that was happening in practice, but it never happened in a game. And it uh, would have been nice given the struggles at quarterback last year. Chase says Adrian Martinez was most of the reason Nebraska was still in games last year. He was just asked to do too much. 
I think he'd be easily the best option if he was on Iowa's roster. I agree, Chase, but would Kirk Ferentz trust Adrian Martinez to run his offense? I think that's a question mark. Um, but I do agree that he would be an upgrade. Jarrett says, plot twist, Howard already shaved his head. Good good call on that. Aka Howard's probably got a shaved head already. Um, Jay says, I think Martinez will have a really good year at K-State. Uh, would not be surprised. Kleiman, I'm sorry. Why did I think it was Klein? Um, no, Kleiman's the head coach. Who's the quarterback's coach? I thought it was Colin Klein. Let me let me look up Kansas State's. Uh, doing this with one hand here. Kansas State's football roster, because I believe you're right. Um, yeah, Kleiman's the, the head coach, but let me just see who the... Uh, who the QB's coach is. Not that anybody cares, but I, I since you brought it up, uh, Colin Klein is, yes, he's the offensive coordinator slash QB's coach. So when you, when you have a guy like that, who is a Heisman uh, finalist, uh, I believe, right. Uh, Colin Klein was, um, I, I, you would have to think, I know players don't always translate into great coaches, but Martinez is going to be helped and Colin Klein could move. Um, and Martinez is one of the more athletic guys um, in the country at that position. And yeah, just never reined it in, but perhaps he can get, you know, get it done with a, a better coaching staff this year. Fred says, uh, have to love Nebraska's winning percentage in the Martinez year. That's a joke. Um, well, sure. But let's remember Fred that, uh, again, coaching plays into this, right? I'm not saying I was equipped to develop a guy like Martinez into an all-star or superstar, but, we have to acknowledge the fact that Nebraska has had problems everywhere. It's not just quarterback. I mean, if you're going to look at statistics, Fred, compare Adrian Martinez's numbers at Nebraska to Spencer Petrus's numbers. It's it's not even it's really not even close. Adrian Martinez was a better quarterback statistically than Spencer Petrus. That's just a fact. That doesn't mean Nebraska was lighting the world on fire, but we're talking about that position. OK, Iowa has had the luxury of an of a defense that is dominant special teams unit that is dominant. That is not something Nebraska has had. OK, so I'm not trying to just be a, an apologist for um, Adrian Martinez, but I think the idea that, you know, if we're going to go with this logic, then we have no problem at Iowa at quarterback. There's no problem at, at Iowa with quarterback because Iowa went, what, 10 and four last year, went to the championship game, went six and two the year before that. But again, there's more involved. This is a three team in one unit. So I'm not saying Martinez would have been a huge upgrade, but the numbers say he would have been an upgrade. But we'll never know. Uh, we'll see what he does at Kansas State. Erica says, I uh, hope you're right. Proof will be in the pudding. I think she's talking about the changes in play calling. I do think there's going to be some changes. I think I just think it would be so foolish if there's not. If we're just doing the same thing and banging our, your head against the wall over and over again, then we really have problems. Chase says... Um, over the last 15 years. Yeah. Nebraska has had issues well beyond Adrian Martinez. There's no question about that. Hawkeye Howard says Kirk will hold Brian back. I'm not going to buy into that Hawkeye Howard. Here's what I, here's what I say about that. I've heard people use that claim, stake that claim for years now, since Brian took over as the offensive coordinator. Uh, I say this, Don Patterson has said publicly as a former offensive coordinator that he doesn't believe that Kirk Ferentz is holding Brian back back. So I'm not there every day. I'm not observing practice, but my guess is Brian has full reins and, and look, he, he's the quarterback's coach and the offensive coordinator. Now, if he doesn't have full reins now, he never will. I don't think Kirk Ferentz is manipulating every little thing. Now they're running his system. I understand that, but ultimately game on game day, this is Brian Ferentz's offense. I do believe that. Thank you for calling from the Hawkeye of the storm. Who's on the line. This is Hawkeye Howard. Hey, Hawkeye Howard. And for the hey, I don't have a shaved head, by the way. Yet. Okay, you're not you're not a you're not a uh, a monk yet. No. Okay. I only said that is, is uh, I'll go on the limb and I'll just put it out there to you and everybody. If Iowa gets biz, wins the Big Ten West in the championship, I will shave my head and beard, which I haven't done for mid twenty years, my beard wise. But anyway, that's not going to happen because of the fact, as I said in the chat. Um, you, I heard you. You're saying this is Brian's offense and all that. 
but Kirk is back there holding him back. Why do you say? Hold on, hold on a second. I'll be right back, Hawkeye Howard. I got to plug this in. Hold on a second. Okay. All right. I want to know. I want to know why you're why you think that, Hawkeye Howard, because you're not the only person who's ever said that. But I just want to know what reason you have to believe that Kirk is holding Brian back. Okay. No, it was remember a, what, a couple of years ago we were actually doing trick plays and then going on fourth downs and that was Brian's offense, I believe. Totally. Yeah, but the tri- well, hold that on a second. Though. Now, now, now we're not. But the trick plays were primarily on special teams. Yeah. So if and, any, and so they weren't uh, running trick plays speed. on offense. They were running trick plays out of punt formations, out of field goal formations. I think. If you're going to attribute that to anybody, that's probably LeVar Woods, special teams coordinator. And I don't think that's yeah. Brian Ferentz. Uh, but I just, I just, I always felt that, you know, Brian, uh, Kurt was always back there saying, well, no, we're not going with four to the fourth down. I mean, you got inches. I mean, we, we run a fullback, put a big old fullback in the heck. I don't care. Put a big old lineman back there, plow through there. Well, they've done that, um, though. But hold on. They <laughs> remember last year? Wisconsin on the road at Wisconsin, they ran the ball. I think they did it at Wisconsin and against uh, Purdue, right? Where they ran the ball twice on third and one and fourth and one, and and ran with the fullback and and missed it both times. So, mm-hmm. I mean, they're they're willing to go for it. They just don't. So far, we haven't seen whether it's Brian or Kirk, whoever we want to blame. We haven't seen ingenuity on offense, and or we don't have the offensive line to be able to do the trick play. Well, yeah, offensive line's going to help you all the way across, right? Um, you're right. The offensive yeah. line's a big problem. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know yeah. how big of it, you know, people, I heard some of the people in the media tweet out today that they think the line's going to be really improved this year. Maybe that's the case. It might be better, but when you lose a guy like Linderbaum and, you know, you lose Kyler Schott, who was a starter, and you lose Cody Ince, who's a starter, I, I don't see them taking a huge jump. I think they'll be better at times, but. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong about that because I do like personnel there. I've talked about that. I like Britt. Yeah. I like Logan Jones. I'm with you on that. Yeah, they just got to be able to. They got to be able to get stronger this this uh, summer. I mean, the, the this is the time. I think offensive linemen. I, I'm not going to act like I'm some expert on this, but I'd love to ask mm-hmm. Don Patterson. We're going to have him on the the uh, show with Mark on Tuesday night. I'm going to ask him this question: What what's the one position that benefits the most? from strength training in, in the summer. And my, my guess is it's, it's linemen specifically offensive linemen. Mm-hmm. Well, I just, I mean, our linemen are just, I, I just sitting here thinking about it. Um, maybe they weren't just up to the par of doing trick plays and they knew it. And so they stayed away from it. And so well, and it doesn't, hopefully I, I we're, uh, hopefully we can get it straightened out. Yeah. They, I, I love the First of all, they need to make changes. I think wholesale changes on offense in addition to just running trick plays. But I will agree with you in, on this in 2017, 2018, they ran a lot of those trick plays out of special teams formations. They were successful on almost every one of them. Okay. And mm-hmm. I do think part of that was personnel. I think they really liked Colin Rast, uh, Colton Rastad or throwing the ball as the punter at the time. And, and he also wasn't a great punter, although they ran a lot of those trick plays out of, out of field goal formations. But my, I wouldn't be surprised if they're a bit hesitant to run those with Tory Taylor because Tory Taylor's not uh, a guy who's used to throwing the football. I mean, he's from Australia. He's a rugby guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but they do have, it sounds like they're going to be using Cooper DeJean, or he keeps saying his name wrong. Excuse me, Cooper DeJean, possibly, as a placeholder. And if that's the case, then you have a guy who could be a potential playmaker and a great athlete who's going to be back there yeah. for field goals, and I mean, I just think that's an opportunity to possibly reignite your your uh, fan base with some trick plays. But they they got to make more changes than just trick plays. But I would love to see them get back mm-hmm. to some of those special teams, um, you know, the, just uniqueness. I mean, that was a unique to Iowa. People were talking about it, and it was successful. I don't know why Iowa got away from it. I really don't. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have to comment on that uh, little conspiracy about going up to Las Vegas and stuff. Mm-hmm. It sounds all cool and dandy, but I don't, you know, it, hey, it could happen, but yet yeah, I don't think it's going to happen. But 
but it, 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 it'd be nice if it did, but if it doesn't, you know, I'm prepared for the season. So, I agree. I don't, I don't think, uh, I, I don't think you're going to see a situation. I'll say this. I don't think you're going to see a situation um, where we're just absolutely astounded at the turnaround that's been made during one off season. I think what fans should realistically hope for is possibly you can get a situation where you can move into the top hundred, top 90 offensively. That would be mm-hmm. progress. I'm not saying it's good enough, but I'm saying it's progress, but I just don't see a, 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 an offense that was 120th overall last year moving into the top 50. Uh, I just, I, if that happens, then Brian Ferentz absolutely was the right choice. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. if he pr- proves everybody wrong, I guess then you got to eat those words because I, I, I just don't see that happening, but they don't need to be top 50. If you can be top 75 in offense, then just I think be, yeah, team just be mediocre. West. Yeah. Just decent, above just a decent. mediocre because last year they were way below mediocre. Correct. You're absolutely right. And I made a prediction. They beat a Michigan and Ohio state. Now, the reason why I did that is because who gives them a, any chance of beating them and that, you know, Iowa, they come up and they bite them and you know, you know where. Well, they have, so, they're going to have a hard time doing it on the road at Ohio State, but I, I can see a scenario. I know, where but they wouldn't win that be pretty? <laughs> oh, yeah. Wouldn't that be something? We'd be flaunting that for a while. Absolutely. So, but I'm just, you know, I, I look forward to the season, but yet I kind of cringe at it like, oh, God, what we're going to be, you know? I understand. We're this. And so, uh, well, we, kind of like, we, they don't call them the heart attack hawks for nothing, right? You got four over four months to cringe and worry, Hawkeye Howard. No, don't be doing that to me now. <laughs> I'd rather go fishing. <laughs> go fishing. Enjoy enjoy the summer, and then once we get to fall, we can talk. We we can worry. Yes. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, so I'll take enough of your enough of your time, and I appreciate you taking my phone call. Appreciate you it, buddy. Hawks. Thanks for calling in. As always, go Hawks. And uh, appreciate Hawkeye Howard calling in. As always, always enjoy. Um, Always enjoy that. Now, Bud says, uh, I'm going to challenge you, Bud, and you're welcome to call in and debate this with me. But I want to challenge this uh, this comment that that uh, it's clear that that the off that Brian Ferentz is running the offense how Kirk Ferentz wants it to run. We understand that this so nobody's no nobody is debating that they're they're running Kirk's offense. We get that right. Um. Pro style offense, you're going to use a fullback. You run the zone blocking scheme uh, with the run game. Um, you know you're going to, the tight ends are going to be a big part of the offense. That's true, but Bud, they haven't been running it effectively. They have not ran Kirk Ferentz's offense effectively whatsoever. Okay, and there have been times on few occasions. 2002 is one where they ran it effectively. So yes, Brian does deserve a lot of the blame. Kirk Ferentz deserves some blame too, but it's not all just, it's not all just schematics. Believe you me. I said it last year, late in the year, multiple problems with the offense involve multiple solutions. And so I agree with you, bud. It's not all just on Brian. It was on Ken O'Keefe. It was on Brian. It was on the quarterbacks. It was on the offensive line. It was on George Barnett. It's on a lot of people, a lot of positions, a lot of problems. All those problems have to be remedied because you don't get to that point. You don't get to being, 120th in total offense in the country, unless you have a lot of problems offensively. And so uh, I get what you're saying. He is running the offense Kirk wants him to run, but that doesn't negate the fact that he's not running it well. And you can't always just defend the coordinator because, you know, um, yes, they, they haven't hired well at that position either. Let's be honest. Greg Davis didn't do, do very well offensively. Ken O'Keefe has struggled most of his career to make this a top 75 offense consistently. I, I That's all true. Uh, and now Brian Ferentz has struggled to do it. Um, but I do believe that uh, Brian Ferentz deserves blame. I just, you know, it's got to be better with what you have, whether you're going to make a change schematically or not. Um, Nick says, honestly, Kirk Ferentz needs the most blame if you have a higher not getting it done with the system, then you have to move on. I agree wholeheartedly with that, Nick. Absolutely. The bottom line is you can't blame Brian for being here. I mean, if he's going to be, if he's going to remain on staff now, I know there were rumors that he wanted to leave this past off season because he was concerned about damaging 
his father's legacy. But you're absolutely right about this, Nick. It is Kirk Ferentz's responsibility. If a position coach or any coach on your roster is not getting it done, then you need to be able to let that person go. If that means you're giving him an opportunity to leave on his own terms or you're firing him, then you need to be able to do that as the leader of this program. The problem is when you factor in, you know, a son, a child into the mix, then it's going to be harder to make that change. So I agree with you, Nick. I think you couldn't have said it any better. Um, And I'm not saying Brian needs to be fired right now. I'm not saying that. All right. But um, I didn't agree with the move. Now we're here. I know there's conspiracy, you know, the conspiracy somebody brought up earlier that, you know, maybe the Raiders end up hiring him this week. I'll be shocked if that happens. Um, regardless though, if Brian's the coordinator this fall, which it looks like he will be and the quarterback's coach, it's now or never, uh, you know, whether you want to blame the, the style of play or not, it's now or never. And yes, Erica, that is when the nepotism issue comes into play. All right. Final call for the phone lines, 515-635-1601, 515-635-1601. Um, if you want to give us a call, give me a call, discuss Iowa Hawkeye football, the wrap up of spring practice. Again, general takeaways for the day. A lot of guys hurt over 20 guys, not in, in, in uniform today. Um, you know, we've, t- we've talked about spring practice extensively over at Iowa football, at the voice of college football here on YouTube. Um, whether it be the lack of depth at tight end and running back, the really quality depth at the defensive line spot, defensive back, specifically safety. Um, I like personnel on the offensive line. Quarterback is going to be the biggest position to follow. There's no question about it. If you missed any of that breakdown, you can check out our recent shows with Mark Rogers. We go live every Tuesday at 430. And just so everybody's aware, I will be going live. Mark Rogers and I will be going live this coming Tuesday, 430 p.m. with the one and only Don Patterson. Okay, Don hasn't been on this show in months. We're going to get Don on with Mark Rogers. So this, this Tuesday show is going to be fun. Tuesday, 4.30 p.m. Central, myself, Mark Rogers, Don Patterson, talking Iowa, and just talking about the next step now. We're done with spring practice. Where do you go now into the summer? What are Iowa's biggest needs this summer heading into fall camp? And I'm sure Mark's got some questions. It's going to be a fun, fun day. So, again, join us Tuesday, 4.30 p.m. right here on the channel. Or, excuse me, not right here on the channel, over at Iowa Football at the Voice of College Football here on YouTube. Um, I mentioned this earlier as well. But if you're interested in sponsoring the show, please reach out to me um, from the eye of the storm at outlook.com. If you know of a business or you are a business or you're trying to get a business off the ground, reach out from the eye of the storm at outlook.com. You can also donate to the channel um, if you're interested in doing so. Um, Appreciated Bradley's donation earlier. But if you'd like to donate, you can either do so by super chat during a live stream or you can donate in the description below. Appreciate all the support because uh, it does help me. It helps the channel to continue to move forward and um, uh, appreciate all of it. The sponsors, donations, everything. Chase says uh, it's more f- fun to just look forward to uh, how Iowa basketball gets in the transfer portal than to talk about Iowa football right now. Well, we'll see. That's a good question. I know this is a, uh, a football show, but uh, certainly plenty of uh, fanfare and discussion about the transfer portal. Iowa in on a couple different big men right now. And, um, you know, more guys are going to be entering the portal, both in basketball and football. Now that football is done, you see some higher, I mean, Nebraska just lost a defensive lineman who was projected to be a starter, just lost him, lost it, lost him this week. And so with spring practices wrapping up, you're going to see more and more guys entering the portal and perhaps somebody ends up on Iowa's radar. And we will see, by the way, now that spring practice is over, somebody, probably multiple people will leave Iowa. Okay. No guarantees on that, but my guess is you're going to lose a couple guys uh, in the coming few days, coming week or so. And now the spring practice is complete. So, um, appreciate everybody being here and, um, we'll be back. I will be back on this channel soon. Don't know exactly when, um, but I will be here. So if you haven't already subscribed, please do so donate below. You can subscribe to our podcast, my podcast on Spotify, Apple, Google, and more. We'll have Don Patterson over at Iowa with the voice of college f- f- football on this coming Tuesday. We're there every Tuesday on YouTube, Iowa football, the voice of college football, 4.30 p.m. So we will join you. You will join us on Tuesday at 4.30. Appreciate everybody jumping on here for a couple of hours. Take care, everybody.